Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome. My name is Frank Rude, and I'm here with my friend and colleague, Alban Hamza. I, we both of us welcome you to the new um, episode of the Crisis and uh, Critique uh, podcast, uh, Philosophy and its Other Scene. We have a very special guest, uh, a friend very dear to us, uh, with us today, namely uh, Catherine Malabou. Um, Catherine Malabou is one of the, I mean, uh, obviously, uh, most uh, well-known French uh, thinkers of the contemporary world. She is professor at the Center for Research in Modern European Philosophy at Kingston University, professor of philosophy at the European Graduate School, and professor in the Department of Comparative Literature at the University of California, Irvine, a position um, that um, previously was held uh, by her uh, PhD advisor, or as we say in Germany, Dr. Vater, uh, Jacques Derrida. Um, she's also, um, some of you might not know this, but a member of the editorial committee of a wonderful journal that you should read, namely Crisis and Critique. Um, I'm just going to mention a number of her early and uh, most recent publications, and then I give the floor and word um, to Argon for the first question. Um, one of her um, uh, uh, early publications, and um, <clears throat> if you have not looked at it, it is absolutely mandatory reading uh, for um, any any anyone in philosophy, namely uh, the future of Hegel, plasticity, temporality, and dialectic. It was translated in 2004, or originally it appeared in 1996. Yeah. Um, in 2004, in English, also traveling with Jacques Derrida, that Stanford University Press. Uh, 2012, the Heidegger change on the fantastic in philosophy. Um, the absolutely monumental, what should we do with our brain in 2009? Plasticity at the dusk of writing, dialectic uh, deconstruction. Um, um, in 2009 as well, the newly wounded from neurosis to brain damage, uh, Fordham University Press in 2012. And the most recent publications include um, Before Tomorrow, Epigenesis and Rationality, that's Polity Press in 2016, Morphing Intelligence uh, from IQ Measurement to Artificial Brains in 2019, Columbia University Press, um, pleasure erased the clitoris and thought, uh, again, polity 2022, and stop thief anarchism and philosophy, plus um, plasticity and uh, the promise of explosion are the most recent ones in English. Um, a tremendous oeuvre, one cannot say anything but this, uh, all this demands engagement and to be read. Uh, we're honored um, that she's with us, and I shut up now and give the floor to Argon for the first question. Thank you, Frank. Catherine, it's great to have you on our uh, on our uh, podcast. So let us begin with your latest uh, publication in English that Frank just mentioned, uh, Stop Thief, Anarchism and Philosophy. This is the thing which came out in late 2023. 20, uh, this book seeks to provide a counter uh, philosophical rethinking of anarchism. It seems to move, so to speak, on two levels. First, by, as you say, dissociating anarchism from uh, anarchy. Here you engage with the work of contemporary philosophers such as uh, Rancière, Derrida, Schurman, Levinas, Foucault and Agamben. And you diagnose that, I'm quoting, although they all accord anarchy a critical value, be it ontological, ethical or political, they fail to truly engage in philo uh, philosophy of anarchism, end quote. And your goal is to interrogate the anarchist failure uh, of philosophical concepts of uh, anarchism. So our first question here would be, uh, how do you differentiate your take uh, on anarchism from their take on uh, anarchy? And the second level relates to uh, what it means to be an anarchist today in an epoch in which, as you say, horizontality is in a uh, crisis. So our second question here uh, would be, what does it mean philosophically to be an anarchist today in a situation in which we could say that politics proper is also in crisis? Is anarchism an attempt to revitalize uh, politics itself? Uh, thank you so much, Agon. So first of all, I want to to say how much, um, how honored and pleased I am to, to do this post podcast with you and thank you for having me. Um, Yes, I, I have, uh, in, in the last book, I have gathered um, all the important concepts of anarchy 
uh, developed by the most prominent contemporary thinkers, uh, mainly Schumann, uh, Levinas, uh, Foucault, Derrida, Agamben, and Rancière, who uh, all once again have a strong concept of anarchy, but I noticed that they never uh, went as far as to declare themselves anarchists, even if they seem to be uh, adamant on the fact that uh, what has been called principles in the history of metaphysics, in the history of philosophy, and the history of politics, principles meaning uh, overarching values and commandments and, uh, uh, let's say, axiological uh, directions for actions. So all of them think and, and write and say that uh, principles are exhausted today. So they say it in, in different manners, but anyway, the conclusion is, is the same. So anarchy, anarchy, as you know, means precisely without principle, uh, literally, and principle means commandment and beginning. So no origin and no principles. So in that sense, uh, they are very close to political anarchism, and yet at the same time, as I said, they never uh, make the leap toward political anarchism that they uh, judge uh, to be too uh, metaphysical, too idealist, and mostly, I mean, the term that comes back over and over is impossible. Uh, anarchism as a political organization uh, would be uh, impossible because either too naive or, on the contrary, too violent. Um, so I try to examine this strange position because you cannot develop a concept of anarchy without referring in a way or another to anarchism. It's impossible. It's not any name. You know, you, you don't you, you don't come up with this word anarchy without having in mind um, something like anarchism. So I, I interpreted this strange position as a denial or a disavowal. And I tried to understand disavowal of what? What exactly was this gesture of, on the one hand, stealing the ideas from anarchism, uh, like the end of principles, etc., and on the other, saying, oh, no, no, but we are not anarchists. Um, so I interpreted it as a gesture of uh, disavowal. Disavowal of what, what? What is the question that the philosophers, even if very radical, mm, what is the question that they were not, in my, in my view, able to to be confronted with, I think very simply, it is what Proudhon calls the uh, governmental prejudice. That is the idea that it is possible to live politically without being governed. It seems very simple, but in fact, it is a very tricky question. Is a political life possible without being governed and without governing the others? And on that point, because Initially, anarchism is, uh, well, about the government. It's very clear in Proudhon, the state, of course, plays a role in anarchism, the critique of the state. But more precisely, and this is the big difference with Marxism, anarchism is really about being governed. Uh, it's about the question of domination. And uh, anarchism is, yes, is thought of as a form of community of being together without a government. And this question, in my view, is something on which all philosophers have stumbled, uh, including Derrida. He could not, he never deconstructed the idea of government. And, and I tried to demonstrate that for each of them. So that's why that's what I, I tried to do in the in the book. Uh, to, um, so yes, to, to, just to conclude on that point, anarchy in philosophy means uh, uh, the result of the deconstruction of metaphysics. Hmm? And anarchism means a political movement, and both cannot be reconciled. I mean, if we if we um, if we read the political philosophers of the 20th century, now about what is it to be an anarchist today? Um, I mean, in a certain sense, I didn't even have to ask myself the question because anarchism is everywhere. That that's the the beginning of my book, and not because we would see anarchists everywhere on the streets. But because capitalism itself is accomplishing an anarchistic turn by promoting values of libertarianism, cyber capitalism, cyber anarchism, uh, the last uh, face of this horror we saw was that of the uh, Argentinian president with a chainsaw, like, let's cut through 
the state and suppress ministers, etc. We are libertarians, and the party is called Ad advanced, advanced libertarians hmm, in Spanish. And so clearly, capitalism, it's another theft, has stolen the main ideas of anarchism and are using them uh, to justify the general uberization of life, this horizontality that we see everywhere. So in a certain sense, and, and, and strangely enough, I came to anarchism uh, through the contrary to anarchism, that is the capitalistic use of it. And I started to, to reflect what, are, what exactly are they stealing? And yes, this is also this idea that a life without a government is possible. Uh, except that in the cap from the capitalist point of view, this is an illusion, of course. This is what they tend to make us believe. Huh? But they are stealing this idea. And so I started to get interested in the, in the tradition of anarchism, reading text and uh, starting to think. And it came to my mind that uh, maybe it wasn't possible any longer to oppose this uh, capitalist anarchism from outside, uh, that is by opposing it, a kind of uh, external position, uh, let's say, socially, more or less socialist. But maybe to situate ourselves on the same ground. Okay, you want you you're talking about horizontality. We are not going to let you steal our horizontality. You know, trying to walk on the same ground and develop a form of opposition that is not external, but internal. So this is what I would say right now. Thank to you so try much. to, I mean, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. No, I, I thank you so much. I think I think um, the, the point that you just made with, let's say, <clears throat> the history of philosophy not having really deconstructed the idea of government on the one yes. side, and almost in a problematic way, Capitalism having deconstructed, yeah, exactly. Problem exactly. the idea of government. Uh, even if, even if, of course, we have very authoritarian governments, it's not, it's not, um, it's not antagonistic. You can have a very authoritarian government, but that is just an empty form, just the form of the police. And behind this empty form, you have this kind of horizontality. Look, look at what Trump says. Well, we don't need to pay taxes. We we don't need the control of the state. We don't need, you know. Um... No, no. I, I mean that that I think that that's that's um, that shows the pressing nature of the problem, or the the, yeah. the, the inter and also the I mean the pressing and the intricate nature of of the problem you raise because you you point out and this is um, um, me m moving to the second uh, second question. Um, you point out that philosophy somehow tried to think without principle, the absence of principles, but well, fell short to put this into practice or to think what a practice of being unprincipled, of being without principle. Yeah. Um, maybe one could say maybe yeah. even being without the principle of being could be. Could uh, be. And, on the, exactly. uh, and, and on the other hand side, um, so that's there is a theory practice blockage uh, almost one right and, and, and that, we, it, it's also reciprocal because anarchists themselves hate philosophy so, uh, so we should write yeah. second book <laughs> to um, I've been accused of being just an intellectual anarchist you know like yeah, yeah. Uh, so so the divide theory practice is very strong um, and this is something we have to overcome this is totally stupid I mean this is well anyway. No, no, but but you seem to seem to make that link. Um, the theory practice link seems to have something to do with the move from being, from thinking, or from the the principle of being, from from moving it from there to forms of life or to the concept of life. That that seems to be for you to establish um, yes. what is needed yeah. to, to, to change the ground. Can you say something about why the, let's say the concept of life or the form of life can, can do exactly this to be on the one hand side, faithful to the idea that philosophy thinks without grounds, without principles, without, uh, guarantee, so to speak. And on the other hand side, um, um, actually makes the move from theory to practice. Um, so, um, um, yes, that's a very interesting question. And, 
in a certain sense, this is what Agamben has tried to do uh, by developing these notions of forms of life and also by developing a strong concept of anarchy. But this is not how I see things because a, a form of life for uh, Agamben is fundamentally destituent uh, and uh, impot impotent, uh, impotentiality, as you know, etc. So there's a strong critique of the notion of praxis. Uh, understood as action. Uh, if I may say, my view of life is more uh, something um, like a weapon uh, that is uh, life understood as um, uh, as a deconstructive tool of any form of government. And I took this idea, strangely enough, to Foucault, uh, the last Foucault, who for many people uh, is um, making a turn to liberalism, etc. For me, it's not absolutely not the case. What he says about Diogenes and cynicism, uh, where he shows that, in fact, this is in the seminar, The Courage of Truth, Diogenes uh, has transformed his life into an instrument of resistance. Uh, and, um, and Foucault says this is the anarchistic turn in Greek uh, wisdom. This is what uh, Diogenes opposes to Plato, that in fact, life is not only the soul, because the soul is always a government. Life is also uh, the totality of, of a soul and a body forming this kind of, uh, yes, weapon of resistance, um, which is okay. What is life then? Life is a kind of uh, manifestation of itself. We have nothing to hide. And in that sense, by having nothing to hide, we are exposing the truth. And as you know, when the truth is exposed in this form, what, what Foucault calls paresia, it becomes very dangerous for power. So I, I worked on that. Uh, I worked on this notion developed by Foucault in the last seminar. Let's stay a little bit longer in this uh, in this topic, if, if if we may. In an interview we did for Christ and Critique Journal, I think we did it in twenty twenty one. You were still working on the on the uh, Stop Thief uh, okay. manuscript. If you're if yes. you're uh, not wrong, uh, in that interview you said the following, and I, let me quote you here. I do think that the concept of class struggle uh, remains central in anarchism. <laughs> but only if uh, economic exploitation is coupled with a critique of domination and the abuse. Domination for anarchists starts with the government, be it uh, political or simply domestic. This relates to what you, uh, to, uh, what you, what you said uh, earlier. So uh, what we are trying to ask is, uh, what is the relation between anarchism uh, and Marxism, if, uh, <laughs> there, if there is one? Because uh, you said... Uh, you, uh, Examine and I quote this wonderful sentence, if 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 I may, the sarcasm uh, with which Marx and Engels ridiculed and marginalized uh, anarchism has not yet uh, been subject to uh, to deconstruction. Uh, so another question within this question uh, would be: uh, Can uh, anarchism still mobilize something of both Marx and uh, and Marxism, or is uh, anarchism the only way to learn from the? Uh, tremendous catastrophic uh, failures of uh, Marxism in the 20th uh, century. Yes, no, thank you so much. That That's a, a very important question. Um, as you know, I mean, the, the divorce between both uh, Marxism and anarchism started very early uh, during the first international where Bakunin and Marx couldn't agree on um, how to talk to the people. Um, Marx defending a, a conception of the party discipline that we need leaders, we need mediators to address the people. And Bakunin saying, on the contrary, no, we need assemblies and uh, we need to go freely from one assembly to the other, but we contest the uh, idea of leaders. So it, it started like that. Um, of course, there are many, many common points between the two traditions, absolutely. Um, uh, scientific Socialism, I think, was uh, Kropotkin's denomination of anarchism. So there are many nominations that are appellations that are close. 
So, but I, I, I knew I had to do more on that point. So in my last book that just came out in France, like two days, two days ago, uh, which is a comment, commentary of uh, Proudhon, uh, what is property? Um, I understood that perhaps the most vital common point was the critique of private property uh, in both traditions. And uh, I started to work on this concept of theft, this time uh, related to property. Property is theft. And Marx, in many texts, in particular the Holy Family, but also in his articles on uh, wood theft, you know, uh, when, um, yeah, the states privatized uh, the commons and forbid people to, to, to uh, gather uh, wood for themselves. So the motive of the theft is very central in Marx, but he accuses Proudhon to be too naive in, in the, by, wh wh when stating property is theft, because Marx's argument is, in order to have a theft, you have to have a property first. So property cannot be a theft because it presupposes property. And what he disagrees with is the idea, we could say in modern term, that property is a performative. This is exactly what it is for Proudhon, that the invention of private property that occurred during the French Revolution, uh, the notion of, of uh, private property is very uh, linked with the French Revolution, was a performative. That is, yes, an event uh, as a theft that erased everything that was existing before. And on that point, Marx fundamentally disagreed by saying no, property, private property, capitalism in other terms, cannot start as a performative. We need to understand that there, there's a need for what he calls, as you know, a primitive accumulation. That uh, private property has a long genesis and this is what anarchists disagree with, that capitalism is a blow, which doesn't mean that it doesn't have a history, hmm? but that uh, uh, capitalism has the power to hide its own history and to appear as, for example, a theft in its full performativity, as if there was nothing before. And this is the structure of domination, to erase people's memory and appear as something new, and I think that on that point, Marxism and anarchism fundamentally disagree. Marxism is always uh, uh, captured, so to speak, by, by the obsession of genesis. Because uh, for Marx, as we know, the genesis of capitalism can only be economic, uh, never political. And precisely what anarchists object to that is no economy, of course, plays a central role, of course, and, and, and Proudhon's book is about labor, so, but uh, fundamentally, um, the, the nature of capitalism, the, 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 how it works is political, meaning by that it has the capacity to appear as a performative, as a blow. And this is, this is in my view, what Marx doesn't really see. And, and, and if you don't see that, you cannot really understand what domination is. Domination starts when you, you are hit by something. And at the same time, you cannot understand why. You know, this, this is the nature of domination, the pure performative of the blow. So yeah, <laughs> this, in my view, I mean, is one of the fundamental disagreements I think that I mean that's 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 a very powerful and interesting account of let's say cap capitalism's emergence as almost like a traumatic event, one could say. Right? Exactly, like, like a trauma. trauma. Exactly, property um, theft, meaning because it is a theft of nothing. Yeah, you know um, this is what Marx does not want to see. He says, no, no, no. It must be there. Must be something before Proudhon. You're contradictory. There must be something before. No. Precisely, Proudhon says it's a theft of nothing, um, and which a theft of nothing, which then I mean, just as you as you indicated a moment ago, undoes its own 
prehistory, one could say. Exactly, and, exactly. And, and that, thereby, I think, um, um, uh, we, what, what, the, the question that, that we wanted to raise next um, is, is already sort of on the table because the idea that one can undo um, the, 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 uh, the, the very history of an event and thereby the performative works in both directions takes us directly to something somewhat a thinker like Hegel, right? Who on the one hand side um, could be qualified as a, I mean, if we look at I mean, standard readings of his political philosophy as the non-anarchist par excellence, right? Um, in the worst cliches as state thinker, that's all untrue, but we know, but nevertheless, um, but 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 um, how, how, I mean, this is what we wanted to, to raise as a question, how does this very complex account that you give of capitalism as a performative event that is doing something, but also undoing something, how yes. does that relate? Um, I mean, one can see why this complexifies immediately the, your take on anarchism, um, right? I mean, yeah. because it goes in. Um, and how does that relate to your account of Hegel? Um, how 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 does yeah. Hegel come yeah. in there? Uh, but but for sure, I mean, you gave me the word for sure. Yes, uh, who don't understand the theft as a trauma, uh, and, and anarchism is. Let's not try to recuperate the memory. It's too late. Let's do with the trauma. Uh, let's start with the trauma that is with the absence of commencement, the the absence of beginning. Yeah. So thank you for the word trauma. This is exactly. I think this is exactly what Proudhon says. So Hegel. Of course, I, I, I was myself surprised, you know, I said, oh, my God, I started to, uh, my career by working on Hegel. And now I'm interested in anarchism and how can both be compatible? At the same time, you know, um, uh, I, I would say two things. First of all, that uh, I, I know th for many people, this will be um, a provocation. This will be provocative. But for me, there's a fundamental nonviolence in Hegel. Uh, I was rereading the doctrine of the concept in which he says that the concept is never in a violent position vis-a-vis -vis alterity. So um, uh, the concept is never a weapon for Hegel. So first of all, I think this is very important. The way in which the system works is always a way to do justice to the real, never to attack it, mm? uh, which of course doesn't mean that that Hegel doesn't think violence. He knows that history is violent, but the way to approach it is never violent. And I think this is extremely important. Um, and the second thing, uh, which is perhaps even more important, is that there is no authority for Hegel. I mean, uh, it does not start, as we know, he says right from the beginning that there's no beginning, that no one is there to tell us how to think, that we don't have any principles. At least at the very we have presuppositions, but as we know, presuppositions dissolve themselves in, in the process. So Hegel is the first thinker, in my view, to affirm that rationality has no principles, uh, that no authority is there, be it religious, philosophical, uh, ethical, um, uh, and that we have to, to do with that. And, and that starting, beginning is the most difficult thing. And this is an anarchist state, hmm? uh, statement, sorry. So in that sense, there is a kind of anarchism of the system. That is, an, what is anarchism? It's a, the capacity to, of, um, of a system to organize itself out of the absence of principles. The problem is that, yes, Hegel was, in a certain sense, um, tempted by... Uh, seeing this as the supreme form of mastery. Unfortunately, uh, I think he, he concluded that this capacity uh, of um, organ organizing oneself in the absence of all authority is the supreme form of mastery. But we can also have a totally different reading and, and, and draw Hegel from the other side. See, so in fact, it, it is not, it, it is perhaps not that contradictory. Yeah, uh, can we move to another topic? Uh, 
Chris. <laughs> yeah, namely uh, to the pleasure erase the clitoris unfold, <laughs> yes. which is uh, a book of yours that has been again recently translated to uh, to to English. Uh, it is a book about the uh, uh, material space of uh, of the feminine that, as you say, has been thus far representatively uh, uh, neglected or eradicated or erased from the history of, uh, for example, of, of uh, philosophy as uh, as such. In what sense is the feminine uh, paradigmatically linked to a specific uh, organ that has been under thematized? And in what sense it is somehow materially in, in embodied, so to say? Yes. Um, uh, thank you very much for this question. I, I would say there are two ways of answering, uh, like with, let's say, uh, traditional feminism and more contemporary feminism. So in the perspective of, uh, let's say, more traditional feminism, by, by that I mean uh, the second feminism from Beauvoir up to Irigaray. It is true that... Um, uh, the clitoris was analyzed as the organ that had always been repressed uh, by religion, by patriar patriarchy, by uh, ethical values, etc. Um, because um, uh, the fact that the woman has two genital organs, so to speak, has always been a problem uh, from the patriarchal point of view. And uh, it, it appears uh, very early in Freud that maturity for a woman necessarily um, necessitates the passage from clitoral pleasure to to um, uh, reproductive to reproduction. That is to the vagina. Huh? Uh, to to be a mature woman is to stop uh, practicing clitoral pleasure and uh, discovering what Freud calls va vaginal pleasure. So this is this kind of uh, negation, disavowal here again of, of the organ of, of the clitoris, which in fact is only made for pleasure and has no role in biology, like no reproductive role. This is the um, this oppression that the feminism of the second generation has uh, thematized and challenged. Also addressing the problem of genital mutilations. Uh, what is the problem is the existence of an organ that serves no goal outside pleasure. Then, in, in more recent terms, uh, I mean, uh, contemporary uh, feminists don't assimilate the feminine with the woman necessarily, which was the case in the second uh, generation feminism I'm ju I just talked about. The feminine became a much more larger concept including uh, all forms of bodies and, and conduct, rejecting domination precisely. And it can include, of course, uh, some masculine models, uh, transgender people, et cetera, et cetera. So the feminine has become a much larger denomination. Uh, and the clitoris, from that point of view, as Preciado says, is not necessarily a sexual organ, but a political locus of Anarchism, that, that something that cannot be governed, something that cannot be penetrated, governed, mastered, uh, and that plays its own, uh, that's, um, yes, it, it, it's autonomous. Hmm? So th there are two epochs in, in, this, uh, uh, in this story. Which means that... Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. Go ahead. Okay. No, I, I mean, just, just, just um, as a spin-off on that, um, uh, of that, um, that seems to indicate that the um complicated argument that you're making is how does one think an autonomous organ? Yeah. If I understand. Autonomous correctly. meaning autonomous meaning not necessarily linked with the sexual difference. Uh, yeah. And in, in, in this sense, I mean, when you say just um, in, in the book, you say <clears throat> the, the clitoris, anarchy, and feminine are indissolubly linked. They form a resistant front aware of the authoritarian tendencies of resistance itself. So, right, I mean, it, it's not that you're simply pitting 
the feminine and against the masculine. So, I know, no, 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 no. I, I never did that anyway. No, no, no. I, I, I know, but, 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 yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but, but you're, 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 you're indicating that one has to think. I mean, what you just described in terms of there's an organ of pure pleasure. I mean, um, yes. That almost sounds, I mean, that's a very Hegelian formulation, one could say, right? It's almost like a concrete universal um, that is neither simply on the side of like the feminine or the masculine, it's not pitting one against the other. Um, I mean, can you, can you say a bit more about how this, this concrete universality, concrete universal, an organ that is self-sustained almost, self-sustaining and fulfills a function that is not goal-oriented vis-a-vis the organism of which it is an organ. Um, how that relates to anarchism? Um, because that seems to be, right, uh, to, to say something about, let's say, the economy and politicality of anarchism itself, of the, the um, right, so it, can you say, I mean, just really, can you, can you clarify this a bit more? Because it's a very intricate idea. Um. So very simply, first of all, um, there are well many books. Many books were recently published about sexuality. What is sexuality? In terms of no sexuality cannot be reduced to penetration. There is uh, today obviously a new exploration of the erotic capacities of the bodies uh, in the plural. Uh, any bodies, uh, anybody. I mean. Uh, it, it includes um, all forms of genders and, and, and sexual uh, behaviors, etc. So there is a, a clearly today a re-exploration of eroticism and the erotic capacities that for centuries have been repressed. So uh, to say that uh, sexuality cannot be limited to penetration means that um, penetration necessarily implies the relationship, it is obvious, between passivity and activity. If sexuality is not reduced to penetration, it means that the couple activity passivity explodes. And this is what is emancipatory, that pleasure doesn't have to be induced by, an, by a command. Uh, by um, it, it cannot be pleasure doesn't have to be passive it, it it doesn't have to be the passive answer to a command or reciprocally the pleasure of the command itself so we are getting out with the clitoris understood as an organ of pure pleasure that is not penetrable uh, we are getting out of the activity passivity thing and I think that politically is very important because it means we we are getting out of the a ruling, obeying duality, dualism. Uh, in another book of yours, which personally I like very, very, very much, uh, in Changing Difference, uh, the feminine and the question of uh, philosophy, you distinguish between two types of, uh, of feminism, namely the traditional and post-feminist uh, uh, feminism. Uh, in your description, uh, the former is continental, whereas the latter is more Anglo-Saxon or, uh, or, or American. Uh, this division can be described, and I'm just connecting to what you said earlier, like can be described also different, differently as marking the, the, dip, dif the difference between sex and, uh, and, and gender. Uh, the way you said the premise of the book is as follows. We begin here with philosophy, asking what for a, for a woman is the life of a, of a, of a philosopher. Uh, there you begin from your experience as a, as, a, as a philosopher, and you move beyond the dispute over essentialisms and anti-essentialism. Is there or is there not a specificity or essence of what is a woman, etc. Then you're going to argue that that more important than sexual difference, what you said, is a difference between uh, women. Could you elucidate this a little bit, this point a little bit for us? Um, uh, so, it is, well, first of all, if you, if you allow me to say a few words about essence and essentialism. Um, Absolutely, is, yes. Yeah, that... Of course, my discourse on the clitoris, etc., can be accused of um, of essentialism. 
uh, uh, because uh, it pertains to anatomy, et cetera, et cetera. So that, and, and my insistence on the feminine uh, that started in changing difference can also be seen as a kind of expression of essentialism. So it, it, it's very vital for me to, uh, and precisely th this is related to my being a philosopher, to, to me being a philosopher, that an essence is not, contrarily to what people say, something fixed and solid. An essence is a transformative entity. And what philosophers ha have called essence uh, is not a substance. It is a principle of transformation. That appears very clearly in Hegel in the doctrine of essence. Uh, essence is, is in between being and the concept as this mediating point that is able to allow for the transformation of being into the concept. So an essence is never a fixed point, but on the contrary, something in, in becoming, something in uh, something moving. So essentialism, the critique of essentialism, the, for me, doesn't make any sense. It just translates a, a profound ignorance of the philosophical terms, ontological terms. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, for me to talk about the feminine uh, is perhaps essential, but if we understand essence as a plastic entity, there's no contradiction. The feminine is always the process of its own transformation. Uh, women between themselves, yes, because uh, you have uh, on the, yes, unfortunately, uh, there are many, many uh, conflicts within feminism because some women precisely don't understand what an essence is and they will uh, insist on the fact that no, there's nothing like the feminine, it doesn't exist because it's an essential, essentialist view. Uh, you, on the contrary, have women who declare, no, we affirm the essentiality of the feminine against the masculine. And you have trans feminism that doesn't want to hear about the feminine anymore. So yes, there are, there are um, unfortunately, I think this is very unfortunate. Huh? We have these divisions that all revolve around the concept of essence that remains totally misunderstood. H hence the importance of being a philosopher, you know, sometimes. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this. I think that's that's a very um um very pointed that changes, uh, for example, uh, Freud's idea that anatomy is destiny, right? Uh, yeah. Because, uh, um, 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 well, if anatomy is understood as that kind of essence, essence in becoming, having a plastic structure, so to speak, a structure that is not a structure, but historical itself in becoming itself, or the structure of becoming, if I may put it like this, um, um, things get far more complicated and more 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 pointed, and one can actually defend the idea um, that there is something like, let's say, um, an essence and a history. As you as you to move on to another book of yours, the Morphing Intelligence, as you point out with regard to the concept of intelligence. So intelligence itself seems to the concept of intelligence seems to have evolved seems to have an essence in this sense, an essence in becoming. Yeah, exactly. So we learn through the history of intelligence um, that you distinguish into different um, uh, periods um, that, 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 that intelligence, to really understand what intelligence is, we have to account for intelligence as an intelligence, uh, as something that is in becoming, like is becoming yeah. um, and transforming itself. I mean, it is part of giving itself a form and receiving a form to to use your um i think um very um uh, amazingly and uh, for that uh, uh, uh reason rightly famous definition of what uh, a plastic or what plasticity is can you can you say a, a, a few more words about what your take on intelligence is especially in the ai discourse which is everywhere these days and so um Universities are very afraid of ChatGPT, for example. Uh, I know, um, uh, as a matter of fact, and how that relates to what we talked about earlier. I mean, I think there's a um, um, absolutely red line about the non-principledness or the anarchism that pertains to the practice of transforming intelligence itself. 
So yeah, well, that's that's of course a, a very difficult question to the extent that uh, who who exactly is able to really grasp what's going on with the development of AI. Um, I think you're totally right to say that intelligence has a plastic development um, and essential in the sense we were um, talking about a minute ago, development. And that, in a certain sense, from the beginning of this history, which is um, a psychology of the 19th century, up to what, what's happening today, there is something that remains. Uh, which is that intelligence is very simply defined as problem resolution. Problem resolution by putting together a uh, different heterogeneous element. Uh, an intelligence is a capacity, and it exists, of course, in animals also, and perhaps even in plants, to synthesize different elements in order to solve a problem. So in that sense, uh, an AI system answers, I mean, this definition perfectly. Uh, it, it fits perfectly with this definition. If we think of uh, neural networks or deep learning, um, so the machine gives itself the means to solve its own problems. So at the same time, what, in my view, what exactly is new in, in this, um, at the same time, in, in artificial intelligence that was not included in the first definitions? I would say that, in fact, it's it plays with uh, the the end of uh, several dualisms: the model copy one, the signifier signified ones, one, and it puts language in relation with itself. Um, this is very clear with ChatGPT, that learns language by accumulating different languages, different ways of speaking on a non -genetic, uh, in a non-genetic form. Uh, so uh, ChatGPT is language in relation with itself. It works also with the visuals. It's vision in relation with itself. So in that sense, we are getting out of the, we're getting out of uh, the difference uh, of the difference. Uh, th this is the end of uh, the reign of difference. So for me, uh, this is something that I've been aware of for a long time when I started challenging the notion of writing in Derrida. I'd say it's the end of difference. But today I think we are totally in, in the, into this. A and people, the technophobic people, absolutely want to save difference, to say, no, 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 but there's a difference between a human being and a machine. There's no, there's, there's no difference. I mean, the difference is getting... Uh, less and less visible. So it, it seems to me that the, the language of objects and uh, language per se have merged. And so, um, yes, something happens at the level of, um, of language, which is uh, that language is cancelling its dimension of difference. And that's for me a total revolution, because until now linguistics have always has always proceeded by uh, 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 underscoring differences, signifiers signified, uh, phonemes, morphemes. That's the end of it. Chomsky was terrified by ChatGPT, saying, "Oh, in an article in the New Yorker, oh, how will we do? We don't, we don't have, um, we we cannot." Um, with Chad, Chad GPT, sorry, is erasing the genetic acquisition of language, like first phonemes, then morphemes. Yeah, of course, because difference disappears. Just as a very spontaneous uh, follow-up, um, would you say thereby what we have to think, therefore, if AI confronts us with a cancellation of difference by means of difference? Yeah. Do we have to think in difference? Do we have to learn how to think? Yeah, like the, this self-cancellation. I, I wouldn't say indifference. Yeah. No, uh, I would say uh, simulation. Um, yeah, we, we would have to think what simulation is. Uh, and that perhaps precisely, it is perhaps not possible 
to differentiate between what is simulated and what is not, including yeah, in the yeah. dialogue we're having now. Yeah. Okay. I'm not I'm not even sure I'm not simulating my own responses, you know. Uh -huh. uh, for the sake of the discussion, you know, to, in order mm -hmm. to be able to say something. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, uh, we I think, and this is uh, with this phenomenon that Trump and, and people like him are playing, it's impossible to know the truth. Mm -hmm. Because after all, everything perhaps is just a simulacrum. Uh, so I, I would say it's more that than indifference. Mm -hmm. Let's move to a different domain. Uh, we want to ask you something. We want to ask you about your uh, philosophical trajectory, so to speak. So when people try to uh, characterize a thinker's work, the temptation is usually to divide it into different uh, different periods. Yes. Uh, so could you tell us a little bit more how how you res retrospectively or retroactively perceive your own? Uh, trajectory. We are asking this uh, because following Derrida, once uh, you said that it's uh, impossible to separate biography or autobiography from uh, and, and and theory. So we are curious about how do you see your own. But uh, do I have to link it with biographical details? No, not necessarily. No, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> um. It's strange because yes, of course there are there are different uh, moments for sure, and at the same time, I have the feeling of uh, of pursuing the same line. So people people say, ah, oh, yeah, that's plasticity, that's her fetish concept. It has nothing to do with that because plasticity is just a key for me, you know. It is just a yeah, exactly. Like when I open my door with my key, that's that's all it is. Uh, it's not that important, contrary to what people think. But at the same time, yeah, I have, thanks to this key, perhaps, I have the feeling of walking on the same ground since the beginning, um, which I think, you know, is the, it, it took a long time, but I think I'm interested in, what I'm interested in is, is the absence of masters. Um, so, I think you can explain the whole trajectory by the challenging of mastery. First of all, Hegel, uh, writing a thesis on Hegel with Derrida was a way to, um, to say, okay, you think you have deconstructed Hegel in, in GLA, but I will show you that's not the case. By insisting on plasticity uh, in Hegel, I will, I will show Hegel, Hegel, you're not as master, as powerful as you think, because you need plasticity. So it was a, a strange dialectical game with the two masters. Then I did the same thing with Heidegger. Uh, that was the second phase. Uh, like you, you in order to in order to address the question of ontological difference, you need a theory of metamorphosis. It exists in your work, but it's not obvious, and I will. Uh, make it appear. So it is also a division of the mastery. Then that, that was, of course, the, the very important period for me of the brain. Uh, what should we do with the brain, but also uh, the new wounded and everything revolving around the new definition of the psyche. Uh, that was also a challenge to the mastery of psychoanalysis and um, uh, challenged the mastery of the mind, of the psyche, and the re-evaluation of an oppressed organ, that was the brain. Then uh, there was the epigeni epigenetic uh, moments with the reading of Kant, the re-reading of, uh, of Kant against speculative realism and, and uh, Meyasu's argument that we could dismiss the transcendental. So, this also was a way to challenge Kant's mastery uh, to the extent that if the a priori is malleable in some way, then the critique is fragile. Uh, well, I'm going very, very quickly. And then 
So there were all the books on feminism, but we already evoked them. They were also in that uh, critique of domination. And then I don't remember, I think anarchism came, came up. Uh, so you see, of course, each of these books uh, has has their own autonomy. And at the same time, they, they, they are linked, you know, uh, with this question that is very simple. Very simple. Uh, can we do without, you know, Chomsky says, uh, anarchism is very simple. It is no bosses. It's exactly, you know, no boss. Huh? That's my idea. Um. I mean, it's quite beautiful how this um, chimes with the idea. I mean, very early on in your uh, PG thesis, um, you, thesis, you um, indicate that um, plasticity is a way of forming a concept of a concept. Right? That is that is how you you enter. Um, mm -hmm. it's, so you change the idea of a certain of what the concept is. And the concept is not the boss. It becomes a certain form oh. of practice, right? Yeah, and that, that's, thank you very much for saying this because um, I don't mind being a philosopher because, you know, some people say it's it's contradictory to, to argue that there is no bosses and to be a philosopher, but you're right. For me, a concept is not a master. Definitely not. Mm -hmm. Can be, it can be. I mean, it depends on, on how, but it's not necessarily one. No, I, I mean, it's, um, and, and it makes perfect sense to say there is something about the, maybe one could say the modus operandi of the concepts, right? Not, or of the essence of the concept, um, to, to speak in the way in which we spoke earlier, in which Hegel would himself speak, um, right? But that, that everything depends on, on what that means. Yeah. Um, and um, you, you, are one of the few, I think, um, uh, um, philosophical thinkers, and this is this is part of why this conversation is, I think, so fruitful and productive. Who, um, um, because this podcast is called Philosophy and its Other Scenes. You were never shy of encountering or entering the other scenes. Uh, you uh, confronted philosophy with very, very different um, other territories or uh, terrains uh, all along. Um, we would like to ask you um, um, something about um, contemporary culture, um, 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 simply because you have yourself evoked sometimes. I think I'm literary, um, or you spoke about Pollock, Kafka, mm. Ross, and others. Um, what is your take on? I mean, we're pending the Oscars. Uh, <laughs> what is your take on contemporary? contemporary film culture um is there anything that that you find uh interesting or worthwhile in something like i don't know oppenheimer barbie anatomy of a fall or zone of interest um something that i thought was well uh no I, unfortunately i don't have a take on that except that when uh in this logic hyper capitalistic logic of um of uh, the industrial culture of movie making, when a movie like the Zone of Interest or Anatomy of a Fall can 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 emerge, that's for me um, something interesting. That's for me an event because it shouldn't have. You know, when you see what kind of film is triumphing, uh, so there's hope, but I don't know. I don't have much to say about that. What is your take on it? Maybe you give me idea. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I mean, for for the zone of interest, uh, I was quite displeased with. Um, I I thought the ending was horrible, but but there is something about organizing a form of life, ah, in the a family in the... life. Ah, yes, of course. Of I mean, no, reproductive no. life. Yeah, yeah, close yeah. to an extermination site, and there is something to. What, how one gets habituated to this, and how this becomes yeah, and how effect. and how it illustrates perfectly our world. Yeah, no, uh, exactly. Exactly, yeah. 
Uh, no, but now we, we we are talking about the content of the movies. But how do you see? Uh, what is your take on the Oscars themselves? I mean, the ceremony, etc. I mean, may, may, maybe it's r rather why we bring this up is um, it is the, the, the festival of dominant culture. Right? Yeah, exactly, like, exactly, uh, exactly. Uh, and so I sense, know that yeah. Slavoj has a very funny way of uh, analyzing those things, but he has a talent that I don't have. I, I, I listened recently to what he said about Taylor Swift, and it was so funny uh, <laughs> when she showed naked. And on the, uh, but I mean, this is Slavoj. You know, I, I don't have this talent, unfortunately. <laughs> you know. Well, Frank and I also have usually a bet on the Oscars who's going to win, and we we are still uh, are set, we? set to do it. So yeah. <laughs> uh, well, let's move to yet another another scene. Uh, uh, could you tell us a little bit, uh, like your analysis of the contemporary uh, contemporary world? The present situation seems to be uh, seems to us to be in in a way that not so really surprising. Uh, the war has become a crucial uh, determining uh, determining factor this could seem reminiscent of the situation a century ago we are thinking of the of the of the great war the anniversary of the beginning of the great uh, great war what is your take on the contemporary political uh, uh, global if you may ask this so uh, so broadly situation and the escalation that we see uh, yeah. that we see everywhere and that seem to create increasingly uh, problematic potentials so to speak uh I, i'm really struck by um the part played by death today uh on the one hand we have uh we are part of this civilized world so to speak in which the individual um uh won't ever accept to sacrifice itself to anything and we we had thinkers like nancy who recently said that sacrifice had disappeared from our world. So um, uh, we have on the one hand, people who refuse to die, who refuse to sacrifice themselves, who are unable to understand how one can uh, go to war for principles or for defending values. So on the one hand, we, we are all we are all what Nietzsche called the last man that is totally selfish, refusing death or um, reducing it to uh, a biological reality, hiding it in hospitals and unable to, yes, to, to, to believe in a kind of collective action. And on, and on the other, uh, we see death everywhere. Uh, we are witnessing what we might call the redeployment of death in all its forms, with the images of Gaza, of course, but also the victims of the Ukraine war, uh, the uh, tortures of uh, uh, Russian dissenters, etc. So we are, on the one hand, indifferent to death, trying to relegate it to nothing. Uh, and on the other, we are assaulted with images of death as if death was, yes, redeploying itself as a reality. And in fact, what we do, I was thinking of that in the West, is that it's, you know, it's like in the bridge game, we are playing the part of the dead, meaning we don't want to hear about death, so we behave as if we were dead already. Um, like, unable to, to, to respond to the, uh, to the challenges of... Uh, of uh, today's situation, unable to answer, un unable to to respond to the Gaza genocide, unable to to take a clear position vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, unable to oppose anything to Putin. Uh, so we are. It seems to me that we should write a new chapter of uh, Freud's thoughts for the time of war and death. We are paralyzed with death. Huh? We don't know what to do with it anymore. Uh, I mean, yeah, we've lost any sense of sacrifice, as I said, any sense of uh, exposure to it. We hide it all the time. And at the same time, we're overwhelmed by it. 
and and this is very difficult to um yeah to assimilate and for me it seems to me that all the politicians are yeah uh like zombies dead people uh, we die in life so to speak because we're unable to address the challenge of this redeployment of death i don't know if i'm clear but i was thinking yeah. of freud yeah. very much th those last days uh the magnificent text about uh war and it's the anniversary right i mean <laughs> of that, oh really that text. yeah, yeah um of that that text if i'm if i'm not mistaken um yeah maybe um, maybe like 1924 this uh yeah 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 exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah yeah okay um, yeah great um, and, um no i mean it um against this background and vis-a-vis uh, -vis your because one of the heroic um elements in your thought is i mean as you endorsed earlier you're not shy of saying that you're a philosopher in some sense that philosophy no not 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 right? shy at all no. Yeah, and, <laughs> no. Uh, no, no, and this is what one cannot but love, and, and should I, I mean, um, and um, in, um, but but it raises raises maybe um the question what after what against the backgrounds like our historical background and a background that sees um transformations um in. Uh, pertaining to the concept of intelligence, something like ChatGPT, on all these fronts, things seem to be changing. What, how, how would you? What is the task of philosophy in all that? Um, what, 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 according to you, what, what would you say? What can philosophy do? I mean, we're almost going full circle to the theory practice question at the beginning. Um, what, what, what can philosophy do? What does? I mean, I would, I would answer uh, negatively. Uh, if philosophy wasn't able to do anything, then we would, we wouldn't see all philosophy departments closing. Uh, I mean, if, if, if philosophy was really uh, impotent and unimportant, and uh, nobody would care about suppressing the departments. You know, clearly today there's a kind of genocide of um, theory. Huh? I can't think of, of another word. It, it's clearly um, a mass killing of all forms of critical thinking, and of course philosophy is included. So there must be a reason for that. As, as we said before the interview, the reason cannot be only economic, because it doesn't cost much to have a philosophy department open in a university. It is clearly a political stance. And, and if philosophy couldn't do anything, then people wouldn't care. So the attack on thinking today is a resistance, is, is a way to show that philosophy is extremely important. Because uh, if we had the means as philosophers to, to speak freely, to have a larger audience, to not be restricted by finances, by budgets, etc., we might perhaps know how to talk to people and, um, and create you know, forms of resistance. So... I'm not, mm, I'm not, uh, I don't belong to the movement of the pessimists uh, re relatively vis-a-vis -vis philosophy, you know, on the contrary. Um, and if we see, you know, all these shit books like, you know, like popular philosophy about, oh, what is, what is happiness? What is, it's because it's, these are ideological coverings of real philosophy that I'm sure is uh, considered very dangerous. Uh, if you go to Russia and, and, and you try to, uh, you know, um, develop some kinds of uh, philosophical discourses against domination, the kind of dialogue we have here, uh, we would go to jail immediately. So you see, And to really conclude, and the last question really connects very well to what you, you, you've been uh, uh, saying just, uh, just now, dear Catherine. Okay. Over a decade ago, you said uh, something like, I'm not really optimistic, but at the same time, I'm very excited by what happens today. <laughs> How do you feel today? Optimistic or excited? <laughs> or you don't feel either, neither nor of these? 
<laughs> well, uh, so optimistic, no. Uh, pessimistic, yeah, on many levels, of course, relatively to what you were saying a moment ago about wars, etc. How can, how not to be pessimistic, but at the same time excited, for sure, for sure, because um, um, I don't know, I feel, I still feel the energy, you know, I, I still feel that something in this world, uh, in spite of all the catastrophes, is still vibrating. I mean, there's an ener energy, energy to th for thinking, energy for creating, uh, for, you know, uh, yeah, building, uh, resisting, so excited for sure. We usually end the podcast with a slightly <laughs> silly exercise, and that's an either or exercise. Yeah. Um, you don't have to opt for either or, you can deny both or opt for either. Um, but anyhow, uh, okay. and you can <laughs> elucidate why you choose uh, what you choose, or but you don't absolutely don't have to. People have responded very differently, and it's usually quite quite interesting to see how. So, oh, there are uh, always the same questions. Uh, no, no, no. We, no, no, no. We, 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 we model them um, and transform them each and every time. Um, so um, I'm, I'm just going to read it out and you, you, you do with them what, what you do. Uh, the first one would be Derrida or Nancy. Derrida. Construction or dialectic? Dialectics. Agamben or Foucault? Foucault. Psychoanalysis or gender theory? <laughs> Psychoanalysis. <laughs> uh, law or justice? Law or justice? Justice. Film or literature? Oh no, this one is terrible. I know. Literature. Sex or gender? Gender. And the last one, organization or association? This one is the worst. <laughs> yes. No. Oh. Um. Organized associations. Oh, that's absolutely okay. love. <laughs> thank you so much. Kevin. No, no, thank it was you. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. We really enjoyed this. Thank you so much for doing it with us. <laughs>